Here lies Raphael. While he lived, nature believed itself conquered. Now that he is dead, it too fears that it will die. There was once a great temple in Rome, which was dedicated to all of the gods. Beneath its perfect classical cupola lie the mortal remains of an artist who in his short life achieved a delicate and rare balance, a serene perfection, a style both natural and ideal, and a charming spontaneous beauty. In memory of the ancient Olympus, on the threshold of eternity, the Pantheon is now the final resting place of the most divine of painters. Until the middle of the 15th century, Urbino was a small brick and stone-built town nestling amid the green hills of an area of the Marche, squeezed between Romagna, Tuscany and Umbria. Then the Montefeltro family took a hand in history and transformed it into a city in the form of a palace. Every last street, house and tiniest corner of Urbino played a role in its quiet harmony, a harmony where elegant proportions, architectural rhythms, and the relationship between city and countryside seems spontaneous and natural and are yet an outstanding example of beautifully conceived design. Raphael was born at three o'clock in the morning on Good Friday, March the 28th, 1483, in this house. It remains beautifully preserved, its small paved courtyard ennobled by a decorative well. The old kitchen and plastered rooms are still there alive with a certain cozy domesticity. There are even a few old pieces of his furnishings. Piero della Francesca's solemn altarpiece had already adorned the Renaissance church of San Bernardino for a good 10 years by the time Raphael was born. This splendid work was both a masterpiece of 15th century art and the most prized commission made by patron, Duke Federico da Montefeltro, who transformed the small and secluded court of Urbino into a sophisticated international center of culture and the arts. The Duke was so impressed that he made it known that he wished to be buried beside this extraordinary painting. Federico, who was always depicted in profile in paintings to cover up the fact that he had lost an eye during a joust, was a true prince and an enlightened cultured gentleman. It is to him we owe the building of the family palace on which work began in 1465. The peerlessly lovely wood in Tarsia of his studiolo tell his story in a symbolic manner. Like so many great men of war, Montefeltro had a great love of peace, even though he spent many years in armor. Now he could finally cast off the trappings of war and abandon himself to the muses. Open the bookcases and the instruments of art and learning are on hand. This small corner situated between the saloons was the Duke's favorite. Around it, thanks to the talents of Dalmatian architect Luciano Laurana, and Sienese architect Francesco di Giorgio Martini rises the most important and perfect example of civil architecture of the 15th century. A place to which artists from all over Italy, Spain and Flanders flocked. These include the great Piero della Francesca who gave it the cerebral flagellation. Pedro Berughetti, the official portraitist of the Duke, sophisticated sculptures and inlay artists. and then Justus of Ghent with the communion of the apostles. Paolo Uccello with the profanation of the host and many others 
Just like the fascinating yet enigmatic panel with the design for a silent urban view, another masterpiece of the 15th century Urbino culture, Federico da Montefeltro's Palazzo Ducale embodies the wonders of an ideal city of the Renaissance, where divine proportion reigns, measuring itself against the breadth of nature. Raphael had been soaked in the spirit of the palace since he was a young child. The light streaming in the huge windows to the white painted halls illuminated mind and heart alike. The same light drew him to look out beyond the walls to the hill, the waters of the Metauro, and the hairpin bends winding their way up to the mountain passes of the Apennines. Raphael's father was one Giovanni Santi, a respected painter and intellectual, an artist at the court of Montefeltro. He also had a thorough knowledge of international art. Giovanni Santi fitted in perfectly in the cultural and artistic context of Urbino. In fact, his wonderfully limpid altarpieces are clearly influenced by Piero della Francesca's Madonna and Saints. Raphael spent his days either in the halls of the palace itself or at his father's studio. His childhood games provided him with much of his training as a painter. He learned how to hold a brush, how to grind colors, and prepare a board or wall for a fresco from his father. And in fact, a fresco painted on the wall in the house where he was born is considered one of his first known works, depicting the delicate profile of a very young Mary cradling the sleeping Christ child. This portrait also marks the start of Raphael's poetic obsession with the Madonna and child, a theme which continually brought back to the artist the sweet yet sad memory of the lost caresses of his mother, who died in 1491 when he was just eight and a half years old. Less than three years later, in 1494, Giovanni Santi, who had remarried in the meantime, also died. At just 11 years old, Raphael found himself alone in the world. He was still a child, yet heir to his father's studio, taking his first steps in his career as an artist and engaged in an emotional battle with his argumentative stepmother. This marked the beginning of a long period of study and learning, during which Raphael built on his early apprenticeship in Urbino through contact with the most famous artist of the moment, Pietro Perugino. Fano, a tiny, delicious court of Malatesta, was home to this stylistic passage. In the church of Santa Maria Nuova, we find, one beside the other, a visitation painted by Giovanni Santi and a good example of his style and two altarpieces by Perugino, his son's new master. One was the sweet and gentle Annunciation. The other, more importantly, the very solemn, sacred conversation. In the predella of this work, painted in 1497, and telling small, amiable stories from the life of Mary, we see the hand of the very young but self-assured pupil the first seeds of a spring that was just about to burst into bloom. Raphael left the Marche with Perugino for Umbria. He began to frequent the austere but beautiful town of Perugia, a city to which he was to become closely linked. In the shadow of the Palazzo dei Priori, he studied the ancient fables depicted by Giovanni Pisano in the monumental marble fountain in the piazza. While his master, Pietro Perugino, was completing his greatest masterpiece, the decoration of the Collegio del Cambio, Banker's Guild Hall. Raphael watched 
As a huge variety of ornamental friezes and motifs from archaeology flourished until they almost completely covered every available space. Perugino's self-portrait appears on the wall where the lanky heroes from the classical myths and the Bible are lined up like a mixed yet sophisticated guard of honor. Raphael, like all of the Perugino's pupils, was involved in the project. By the time he was 16, the precocious Raphael was referred to as Magister, or Master, in his contracts. And although he remained in contact with Perugino, was already running his own studio. The patrons of Città di Castello were the first to place their trust in this young man and commissioned from him several very interesting works in around 1500, almost all of which ended up elsewhere, however. Nonetheless, in the splendid Renaissance Palazzo which houses the Pinacoteca Comunale, there remains the standard of the Church of the Trinity, which, despite being badly preserved, retains a certain bright beauty especially in the serene scene of the creation of Eve. The Church of San Domenico was also home to a huge crucifixion, heavily influenced by Perugino's style, which is now hanging in the National Gallery in London, although a copy has remained in Città di Castello. The great altarpieces painted by Raphael in Perugia around 1503 also met a similar fate. Amid its towers, palaces and stern stone walls, Perugia was celebrating the first signs of the Renaissance with its own delicate, elegant school of painting. Now ready to compare himself directly with the Umbrian style in general, and Perugino's in particular, the 20-year-old Raphael planned a solemn, complicated, dazzling altarpiece for the Church of San Francesco al Prato, which is now housed in the Pinacoteca Vaticana. It is clearly divided into two sections, the lower part which depicts the apostles gathered round the sarcophagus, and the upper part which shows the crowning of the Virgin Mary. The luminous Pala Ansideuas was painted for the Church of Serviti, but now is in the National Gallery of London. A beautifully balanced theorem of geometry and light, it has overtones of the style of Piero della Francesca. In 1504, having returned to Città di Castello, Raffaello painted the masterpiece which marked the end of his youthful journey. It was commissioned by the Albizzini for a family chapel in San Francesco. The scene is the courtyard of the great temple, which softens into a far-off landscape of hills, fields, and woods. At its heart lies the open double door at the center of the temple. Marriage of the Virgin, now in the Pinacoteca di Brera in Milan, is a clear homage to Perugino, but still shows how the pupil has surpassed his master's models, suddenly rendering them old-fashioned. Grace reigns, no emotion prevails, not even in the group of disappointed suitors who are depicted breaking their staffs. It is signed and dated in beautiful classic script by Raphael, who refers to himself as Urbinate, or from Urbino. On the 1st of October, 1504, Giovanna Feltria della Rovere, of the rising Urbino family, wrote to the gonfaloniere of Florence, Pier Soderini, to recommend the 21-year-old Raphael who wanted to study Tuscan Renaissance art. <laughs> 
Raphael quickly mastered the limpid rhythms of Brunelleschi's architecture. The serene geometry of Leon Battista Alberti and the nobility of Donatello. The work which best embodies the strongest political and civil ambitions of the Florentine Republic is the David, Michelangelo's monumental masterpiece, which was erected outside the Palazzo Vecchio just before Raphael arrived in Florence. In the most solemn chamber of that same building, Raphael witnessed the confrontation between Leonardo and Michelangelo, who were then engaged in creating two battle scenes, both of which have sadly since been lost to history. One was a clash between mounted horsemen and the other a study of very virile and athletic nudes, both executed under the artistic policy dictated by Pierre Soderini. Michelangelo, then almost 30 years old, was the most convincing heir to the Florentine tradition of drawing and figure painting. With the Tondo Doni, he introduced the plastic solidity of a group of figures, which marked quite a departure from Leonardo's sfumato style. Having returned from a long sojourn at the court of the Sforzas in Milan, Leonardo was now introducing a new sensitivity to light, movement, and portraiture to Florence. The 50-year-old master, who was then painting the Mona Lisa, became a reference point for Raphael's first years in Florence. Due to his talent for capturing the fleeting expression which reveals the very soul of the sitter, Young, handsome, inspired, and perfectly educated in the etiquette of the intellectual courtier, Raphael quickly rose up the ladder of success. He was welcomed into the palaces of all the great families of Florence, for whom he executed small collection paintings and unforgettable portraits, preserved in part in the Palazzo Pitti at Florence. One example of such patrons is the couple who also commissioned the Tondo Doni from Michelangelo, Agnolo Doni, and Madalena Strozzi. His busts of mysterious, attractive ladies show hints of Leonardo's approach. The expectant mother was, for the very first time, set against a black background. And the wonderfully elegant gentlewoman with unicorn, where the unicorn, a symbol of purity, is held as if it were a cat. most especially the enigmatic and extraordinary lady with the tightly shut mouth, traditionally known as La Muta, exhibited in the Palazzo Ducale at Urbino, where the secret language of expression, detail, jewelry and clothing has yet to be deciphered. Raphael began work on an exceptional series of Madonnas, painted on wood for the same Florentine families, all of whom were highly informed and sophisticated with regard to art. In their movingly beautiful natural and calming smiles, Raphael draws us into an extraordinary series of variations on the most famous and popular theme in the history of painting. One after another, Raphael's Madonnas added to a gallery of enchantment tiny gestures, knowing smiles, and delicate tendernesses, as well as demonstrating his exceptional skill at producing increasingly complex poses, groups, landscapes, light, and situations. Raphael brought his busy Florentine period to a brusque end, with the unfinished, quivering, and completely new Madonna del Baldacchino, or the Basilica of Santo Spirito.
The sunny sweetness of the Madonnas, painted by Raphael when he was about 24 years old, cracked in the tense climate of battles and quarrels which were breaking out in Perugia. There was a power struggle going on between the members of the Baglioni family, which became so bitter it bordered on outright civil war. Grifonetto, stabbed to death by his relatives, paid the price with his life. His grieving mother was inconsolable and commissioned Raphael to depict her terrible torment. Thus, the transportation of the dead Christ was painted for the Church of San Francesco, although it now hangs in the Galleria Borghese in Rome. For this work, Raphael created a complex scene in which a whole range of references to the classical statues is combined with the drama of the moment. Departing once more from Perugino style, Raphael came up with a new and very intense piece which captures the height of the tragedy with the Madonna fainting. Still in Perugia, Raphael returned to fresco work in the oratory beside the monastery church of San Severo and painted the Trinity surrounded by a half circle of saints seated on clouds in the upper part of a lunette. Several years later, Perugino, now clearly outstripped by his pupil, added the six standing saints lower down. Even though badly preserved, the fresco in San Severo is considered the trial run for the new commissions that Raphael was about to undertake in Rome, where the Renaissance truly flourished at its height. Raphael arrived in Rome in 1508 at the age of 25. The Eternal City revealed to him all of the glories of antiquity and the huge modern constructions carried out under the control of the Urbino-born artist Bramante. At that time, Julius II, one of the greatest, most energetic and controversial popes in history, was on the throne. He was the pope who began rebuilding St. Peter's and commissioned Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel. He also asked Raphael to decorate his private apartments in the Vatican. The Raphael Stanze were begun in 1508 and finished after the painter's death. They are one of the most moving series of apartments in the world. When Raphael arrived in Rome, Several famous artists had already spent years working on the papal apartments. Julius II recognized the great talent of the young painter and in a typically imperious gesture had all of the newly completed work destroyed and left its replacement entirely in the hands of Raphael. The first room or stanza had once been the Pope's private study. On the wall destined for books of theology Raphael painted the huge, grandiose Disputation of the Sacrament. In the light of a sunny morning in the Roman landscape, a double semicircle of saints and theologians are arranged around the central peaceful figure of Christ and the altar on which the monstrance rests. On the wall devoted to philosophical works, we find the School of Athens. Beneath the large vaults of the Temple of Wisdom, Plato and Aristotle lead a group of ancient philosophers. Plato, an idealized portrait of Leonardo, is pointing towards the heavens, while Aristotle indicates the earth. All around, in a huge range of poses, expressions and gestures, we have one of the most vibrant and complex groups of characters from the history of art ever painted. There are some other famous faces in there too. Michelangelo is the scowling, solitary Heraclitus. Bramante is represented as Euclid, with his compass in hand. Raphael himself appears half-hidden, his face pale and thin 
with still a trace of adolescence about it. For the works of poetry, Raphael chose a view of Mount Parnassus with the Nine Muses, and Apollo is depicted playing the harp. It is almost as if Apollo is inviting the poets of all of the ages, crowned by laurels and magically evoked together in the Garden of Eternity, to dance. Raphael worked on the Stanza della Segnatura until 1511, and his fame grew with the years. He now boasted the busiest studio in all of Rome, with a whole generation of artists learning their trade alongside him and how to deal with increasingly complex projects. A comparison of the works completed during this period shows just how exceptionally varied Raphael's figurative language had become. He also received a very prestigious commission from Agostino Chigi. The incredibly rich Sienese banker had moved to Rome and built a beautiful villa on the banks of the river Tiber. This was to become known as the Villa Farnesina and was decorated by masters of the caliber of Baldassare Peruzzi, Sodoma, Sebastiano del Piombo. In 1511, inspired by the classical myths, Raphael painted a fresco of the triumph of Galatea, a return in paint to an episode from Ovid's Metamorphoses. It depicts a scene of crystalline purity, an expression of Raphael's great love of the art and literature of antiquity, a balance of perfect creation and immediate seduction. Arranged on a shell drawn by dolphins, showered by arrows from the bows of smiling cupids, the beautiful nymph is turned towards Polyphemus, the rough sylvan giant, who is beside Sebastian. Again for Chigi, this time in the church of Santa Maria della Pace, a homage to Brunelleschi's ideals, Raphael painted a sequence of sibyls over an arch. These represented an example of rhythm linked by gestures and glances frescoed along a curved cornice. Raphael worked ceaselessly during this period. The Prothonotre Apostolical Rothmagen commissioned ambitious projects for the beautiful Renaissance Church of Sant'Agostino. In the interior, Raphael pays open homage to Michelangelo by painting the prophet Isaiah on a pilaster supporting a marble group by Andrea Sansovino. He is depicted as an energetic individual with an intense, concentrated face who seems to have descended from the vaults of the Sistine Chapel but is also softened by the presence of two delicate angels. Santa Maria in Araceli, high on the capital of Rome, was also once home to one of Raphael's great works, the Madonna of Foligno, painted in around 1511, and now residing in the Pinacoteca Vaticana. This is an ex voto monument of a cardinal whose house escaped damage when a meteorite fell on it. Although contemporary with the very classical triumph of Galatea and the Michelangelo-inspired Isaiah, the altarpiece abounds with the landscape, color, and light of Venetian painting. Particularly famous for the detail of the two pensive angels leaning on the windowsill is the Sistine Madonna, which was originally housed in the church of San Sisto in Piacenza, but which had found its way to the Dresden Art Museum by the 1700s. The Virgin's face is reminiscent of that of one of Raphael's lovers, Margarita Luti, the daughter of a baker of Sionese origin. She became famous under the nickname of Fornarina. The nobility of the antique, the power of Michelangelo, the color of the Venetians, and most of all, a new dramatic energy characterized Raphael's style in his 30th year while he was working on the second Vatican stanza, begun in 1511 and finished in 1514. 
one year after Julius' death. The general tone of this stanza is more intense and violent than the first, and is a very clear illustration of the Pope's political will. The Mass of Bolsena calls to mind the miracle of the body of Christ, the host which bleeds when broken by the incredulous priest. Julius II is depicted kneeling in front of the altar, accompanied by an unforgettable group of Swiss guards in full gaudy costume. The scene which gives the room its name illustrates a passage from the Bible in which the profaner, Helidorus, is expelled from the temple by three celestial creatures. The flashing light adds to the tense, violent nature of the fresco, which alludes to divine intervention protecting the church in peril. Here too, Julius II plays an active part in the scene. In 1513, while Raphael was painting the Stanza di Eliodoro, Julius died. The extraordinary fresco, the liberation of Saint Peter, a miracle of luminous, magic, nocturnal effects, silence and lunar emotions, is probably a homage to the death of the Pope and his leaving this earthly prison. The new pope was a Florentine, Leo X, a man of peace and moderation, in stark contrast to his fiery predecessor, who loved getting into violent clashes. Raphael knew Leo X's character well, and a few years later represented him with breathtaking exactness in the grandiose portrait which now hangs in the Uffizi. Leone X is depicted leafing through a precious Bible, with an expert hand, while two cardinals look on at his side. The painting is a blaze of purple flashing glances and emotion. Raphael also began work on the third stanza for Leone X in 1514. This was called the Stanza dell'Incendio di Borgo, after the theme of its main fresco, which was also the only one to be painted personally by Raphael. It depicts a blaze in medieval Rome and gave Raphael free reign to paint a spectacular range of gestures, costume and characters from antiquity. Raphael's fresco remained a source of inspiration for almost a century and was an obligatory reference point for Mannerist painters. Raphael was working furiously. His intellectual role had broadened to encompass new horizons, such as architecture, the study of archaeology, and the preservation of the artistic heritage and the organization of increasingly ambitious decorative arrangements. A very eloquent example of the latter was his new commissions for Agostino Chigi. In the same villa on the banks of the Tiber, in which he had completed the triumph of Galatea a few years previously, Raphael now coordinated the completion of the ornamental frescoes, leading his team in the execution of the frescoes in the Loggia of Cupid and Psyche, which they decorated with a whole host of gods. Here, nostalgia for the antique became an amusing team effort, from which the personalities of Giovanni da Udine, Giulio Romano and Perin del Vaga all emerge. For Chigi's funerary chapel in Santa Maria del Popolo, Raphael designed an imaginative and audacious decoration of the gauze of the cupola with sparkling mosaics, in addition to directing the architectural and sculptural work for the whole complex. A project on which great amounts of precious marbles and other costly materials were lavished. It was becoming increasingly common for Raphael to entrust the actual execution of his projects to his pupils in order to concentrate on the creative side of his work and on producing his stupendous drawings. Nonetheless, unforgettable masterpieces continued to flow from him, each one turning a page in the history of art.
Take, for example, the clamorous still life of musical instruments in the stupendous ecstasy of St. Cecilia in the Pinacoteca Nazionale of Bologna. Or the dizzying sweet vortex of beauty that is the tondo of the Madonna della Seggiola where the sublime perfection of its geometry harmonizes with a fresher kind of spontaneity and naturalness. There were also tens of portraits of illustrious people, each seemingly in direct conversation with the viewer. These included the friendly-looking Baldassar Castiglione, the dynamic Fedra Inghirami, with the sophisticated young cardinal. Raphael also painted a portrait of himself with a friend, his oval face framed by a short black beard. And finally, we have once again the smiling face of Fornarina, the picture of demure seduction. Raphael signed this particular portrait on the band his beloved wears around her plump arm, almost by way of a caress. In the last years of his life, Raphael became particularly interested in architecture and renovating classical decoration. One partially finished project of his is the splendid Villa Madama in Rome. The completed parts are decorated with beautifully calibrated stuccos and frescoes, directly inspired by the Nero's Domus Aurea and the other archaeological digs then underway. Raphael was also appointed curator of the antiquities by the Pope and planned to restore the monuments and produce a map of ancient Rome. The exaltation of the antique was reflected in the Vatican works to accompany the continual spread of palaces designed by Bramante. Cardinal Bibiena's Logetta is the apotheosis of the ornamental genre and is decorated with stuccos and frescoes known as grotescheria that is derived from the classical repertoire found in the grottos, underground caves in Nero's palace. These were also supplemented by original creations. And finally, as if in a crescendo of grandeur and complexity, we have the majestic lodges, a huge group effort in which all of Raphael's pupils and collaborators took part a collective game of creation, compositional surprise, and the invention of new models. Raphael was now at the pinnacle of his career and had become the obligatory reference point for all artists and intellectuals. The very ideal of the Renaissance was taking shape around him. He was helping to inspire a return to a society modeled on the classical one, yet modern in its own way. Destiny, however, was about to overtake this artist chosen by the gods. Raphael was working on a large altarpiece when a strange portent came to the Vatican. His last brushstrokes were on the grandiose transfiguration in the Pinacoteca Vaticana. This is a very lively scene, full of impressive portents and emotions. In the lower section, the apostles and other characters move between bright color and deep shadow to emphasize the intensity of the gestures and features. The crowd is milling around a possessed boy who has been miraculously healed. Higher up, in a very rarefied atmosphere, we have the image of a radiant Christ rising toward the light, a symbol of purity and the absolute. On Good Friday, April the 17th, 1520, a crack opened in the palaces, just like the temple curtain was rent in two when Christ died. Plagued by a mysterious fever, Raphael died during that night at the age of just 37. 
news spread within a few days, it seemed a sign that an era had suddenly been brought to an abrupt end. Raphael made more progress on the road to achieving perfect beauty than anyone else. In fact, he almost achieved it. And now with him, beneath the cupola of the Pantheon, the temple of all the gods, is buried forever the image of the sweet nostalgia of eternal youth.